This conference will now be recorded. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Um, so for the Easter season, at least for a few weeks, um, I want to spend some time actually um, talking about the symbols of Easter that we have in the church. Um, I was uh, thinking about the stories that we might tell and talk about, and it occurred to me that since none of us are in our space, in the church, um, but at Easter time, we're surrounded by so many symbols of uh, resurrection, of new life, of all the things that Easter means to us as people of faith, um, that it would be, um, it might be really interesting and helpful to spend some time remembering those um, and just talking about what they mean during this time. So the first question I want to ask you all, and you can respond in the chat, um, or if you want to respond aloud with just a couple words, um, what is one thing you notice in the church at Easter time that is different than Lent? Uh, I was going to say that the uh, the cross that's not covered, but it's only covered Good Friday and you know, but the open cross, He is risen. Yes, definitely. And in the in the chat, we have the candle, the Paschal candle. Um, the colors of the hanging they change. Anybody else want to offer a response? Yep. Lilies. Yeah, the lilies that we have at Easter time. Yeah. So from Lent, this time of preparation to get us ready for Easter, um, into Easter, the church goes through a big transformation. We have um, a purple as the main color of Lent. Um, and then in Easter, we get a totally different color. Um, and Lent, there usually is less sound. There's less, um, sometimes there's no flowers on the altar and during Easter time, we get lots of flowers and lots of sound, lots of music. And so, um, so today I wanna talk about three of the symbols that are um, the ones that we see, the more visual symbols um, of Easter time. So the first is the color white and it is the color that we get on the altar. Um, and it's also the color that appears in um, the white Easter lilies. Um, but it's also the color of the linen that is always on the altar, no matter the season, on the very top. And I just happen to have a white linen cloth at my home. So I'm spreading this out to show you, um, to give you a visual symbol. And what's interesting about why we have the color white and this white linen, especially on the altar table, is um, it represents the cloth that were wrapped around Jesus' body when he died and was buried. And in two of the gospel stories that we get about the resurrection, uh, some of the disciples go into the tomb and all they see are the straps of linen that are left behind. There's no Jesus in the tomb. And so what's really interesting about this linen, this in the color white that's associated with this linen, is that it tells us that death is not the end for Christ and it's not the end of us, um, that God has brought new life out of death. And this is the reason to celebrate and rejoice. And so this color is also the color that is traditionally used for baptismal clothes. When you are baptized, often you're clothed in white um, or put in white um, clothing of some kind. And it's 
like the one of the um, the letters that Paul wrote, he talks about as many as you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, and it's kind of a connection that we have in putting on white clothes at baptism. It's a connection to Jesus' own death and resurrection and our hope for the promise of new life in him. So this is the first symbol I want to highlight. And um, and I want to invite you to see if you can find something at home that might bring this symbol into your house that you could put on a table or you could put even on a small desk or box or something. It doesn't have to be a cloth. It could be a white towel, it could be paper towel, it could be just even a white piece of paper or something like that. Um, just as a symbol to remind you of this, uh, this cloth um, showing us that Jesus is alive and that we have hope for life in him. So the second symbol I want to um, talk about is one that um, was mentioned and that is the cross. So I happen to have a cross like this in my house. Um, and during Lent, the cross is often veiled. Um, if it's a ornate one that kind of looks rolled like this one or a shiny metal or something, it might even be taken out of the church. Um, but the crosses that we typically have on the, um, the, the one that the crucifer bears at the beginning of the procession into the church, and then the one that's on the altar wall um, behind the altar, um, those are unveiled at Easter time, and they're empty. Um, and so these crosses, it's similar to the white linen that we have. We do this because this symbol of, the, of how Jesus died, the cross, is turned into a symbol of life when he is raised from the dead. Um, and, and Paul is another, another one of Paul's letters captures this really nicely when he says uh, the word of the cross um, to us who are being saved is the power of God. Um, so with, with the cross, the symbol that had been a symbol of death um, becomes a symbol of new life. And so, um, so things that you could do um, at home, if you have a cross, you could put it on or near this, um, your linen. Um, if you don't have one, I sent a printable paper one um, online that you can use. You can um, color it in. You could take... Um, colorful pieces of paper and cut different shapes to make it look like a mosaic cross. I've seen people do that before. Um, you could even um, cut it out and post it on something. You could make your own, um, you could make your own cross that you would bear if you were the crucifer. Just tape this to a long, a long tube of empty wrapping paper. Um, that would work. So, so that's another symbol. And the last one that I want to highlight is um, another one that was mentioned, the Paschal candle. And the Paschal candle shows up at the Easter vigil, which we usually do on Saturday night. And, um, and it's lit and it's the candle that is carried at the beginning of the procession into the church when it really dark and um, and then it's placed near the readers um, who read all of the scripture stories um, before we then launch into the big celebration of Easter and what's interesting about the Paschal candle um, Paschal is a word that comes from Greek that means Passover and so um, so it was connected early in the church to um, the Jewish feast of Passover that commemorated liberation from Egypt and from um, the people getting set free um, in Egypt from enslavement. And, um, and early Christians interpreted Jesus 
as the Paschal Lamb, that he was, um, he was just like the lambs that were sacrificed so that God could liberate the people. And so, um, and so this, um, this candle is also called the Christ candle sometimes. Um, and it is uh, what we say is the light of Christ at the beginning of the Easter Vigil. Um, and so um, what I find interesting about what this means for us is that we have this light that contrasts with the darkness that came over the earth in the gospel stories when Jesus died. And this light shines um, as a way of, um, I guess the way I connect it, that um, Jesus gave his life um, as an act of love. And this is how many people have talked about it in church history. Um, he gave his life as an act of love for others and received new life from God. And, um, and I think of it as this love is powerful, like a light shining in the dark. And, um, and they show um, liberation from all that goes against the life and love of God. And, um, and I also think about a sermon that I heard Bishop Curry talk about, um, that when we are baptized, that our lives become like light too. Like he, I remember him talking about that, that, that song, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Um, that when we are baptized, that we shine too, like Christ. And so um, if you wanted to make your own Paschal candle at home, all you would need is something like a paper towel uh, tube. You could also use toilet paper tubes. You could also use just a really thick piece of cardstock and a blank piece of paper. And on the blank piece of paper, you can draw the designs that you want. Um, the ones that I included here are a cross and then two letters. And these are Greek letters, the alpha and the omega. And those mean the beginning and the end, that Jesus is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So. You draw your symbols on the paper, whatever you want to include. That would be a symbol of uh, resurrection life. And um, roll it up, and then you can tape it and, or glue it. Um, and then you can have your own Paschal candle at home. And so those are the three symbols I wanted to talk about. Um, and I guess. The, the things that I would invite you to think about um, with these symbols in particular, um, to contemplate which one might be the most important to you. And um, do you see God in these symbols? And what does God look like or sound like or feel like through them? And could any of these symbols be left out and you'd still have all the signs of Easter that you need? So that's, that's all that I have about these three different symbols. Um, and next week I'll talk about some of the symbols of Easter that we typically touch and taste. So, um, so, yeah, thank you all. Thank, thank you. you, Judy. That's terrific. <laughs> I really like the Pascal candle. As if we have any paper tubes left around, though. Um, so, good morning, everyone. Let's say hello and visit for a second. It's great to see you. Um, you don't morning, have to everybody. observe the discipline. Good morning, everybody. Hi. It is morning. morning. Happy Easter. <laughs> Happy Easter. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. 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 Up. Oh.
just one microphone on at a time in a room. If you have two microphones on in a room, like a phone and a computer, you're going to get some terrific feedback. So, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Colin. Good morning, Grace. Hey, so uh, we've got just a minute. Um, good to see you. Wonderful to see you. Um, I hope you've been getting your uh, phone calls uh, from uh, the various persons who've been tasked with those uh, phone calls who enthusiastically uh, agreed, wanted to, or excited about making them. I hope you're having um, good calls, that you're letting them really into what's going on with you so they can relay those to me, so they can put them in your prayer, their prayers, uh, so you get what you need. Um, and let us know what your neighbors need. Um, if we can be of any help, uh, I or individuals in the church, if we're going shopping for one, maybe we can go shopping for two. Um, we can leave them on doorsteps. We can uh, leave a card or a note or a whatever we need to do. Um, we have some resources um, that we'd be happy to use on behalf of those that you know who need them. Uh, let us know about those. I'll turn this up just to make sure you can hear me. Um, so that's just something I want to say hello to and hi about. Um, and again, please take a look at uh, Jody Belcher's formation programs throughout the week. There's quite a few. And uh, we'll be adding more, I think, uh, in the next uh, weeks as we go forward. I think we're going to be uh, away from our church a little longer. Um, who knows how long, uh, but uh, we're going to continue to uh, revise and uh, sharpen, or what's the word, just improve uh, the ways in which we can be together um, and support each other and pray together and uh, uh, be of support not only to each other, but to those who have no uh, support like this. I mean, how wonderful uh, to, you know, to have 50 of us together here um, to worship, to turn our thoughts and our hearts and our prayers towards God, uh, to know that we have a place to turn them to. Uh, there, there are those uh, who still, you know, uh, don't have this. If you want to invite them, uh, we have 251 slots uh, available, and I'm sort of touch, uh, treading on dangerous ground because uh, if we invite 500 people, we'll squeeze ourselves out of this uh, space. But you know, I think we've got room for uh, at least each of us to invite one person and see where that takes us. And, uh, you know, if we need, God forbid, we should have 500 people wanting to join us uh, for services. But if we do, we've got ways and means by which we can change uh, what we do and how we do it. But let's let's go ahead and make sure our, our children and grandchildren and uh, neighbors, those we know and love, have a place uh, that they can uh, get the solace of worship and prayer. Speaking of which, we've reached the uh, magic hour and I look forward to entering into prayer and praise with you. Let's have good microphone discipline. I'll let you know when I want to hear the raucous uh, sound of all our voices in a cacophony of uh, tongues. But right now though, we're gonna uh, turn over uh, our uh, microphones to mute and let uh, Colin and Grace lead us in our first opening hymn which I have printed out, I hope you did, because it's a lot easier to see and easier to sing if you do that. So, however, if you haven't, it's on the screen in front of you. Colin? Good morning. Oh. Jesus, King of Heaven, 
Be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to set forth His praise, to hear His holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things that are necessary for our life and our salvation. And so that we may prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship him. Let us in silence and with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Okay, I muted the camera. Okay. Let us pray with the microphones muted. Most merciful God. We confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Continuing with the Pascha Nostrum, I will read to the asterisk, and then all of you, with mics muted, read in your homes to the next asterisk. And I'll, uh, well, let's alternate verses is what I'm saying. Let's give that a try. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. So also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Alleluia. For since by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. We now turn to a reading from Acts. A reading from Acts. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonder, and signs that God did through him among you, as you yourselves know, this man, handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, 
<clears throat> you crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up, having freed him from death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will live in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One experience corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Fellow Israelites, I may say to you confidently of our ancestor David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would put one of his descendants on his throne. Foreseeing this, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, saying, He was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh experience corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that all of us are witnesses. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now, uh, with our microphones muted in our own homes, let us say together the third song of Isaiah. And I'll wait for that to come on the screen. We'll say this together in our own homes. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has dawned upon you. For behold, darkness covers the land, deep gloom enshrouds the peoples. But over you, the Lord will rise, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will stream to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawning. Your gates will always be open. By day or night, they will never be shut. They will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. And your people are dumb enough to do it. Violence will no more be heard in your land ruin or destruction within your borders. You will call your walls salvation and all your portals praise. The sun will no more be your light by day. By night, you will not need the brightness of the moon. The Lord will be your everlasting light and your God will be your glory. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Let us now turn to a reading of First Peter. A reading from the first letter of Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Colin and Grace will now lead us in. Humbly, I adore thee, verity unseen. Thank you. 
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you return, retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, who was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my fingers in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. So, the disciples were behind locked doors hmm. because they were afraid. They were behind locked doors on Easter day. And a week later, they're still huddled behind locked doors, frightened, hiding, and at least in Thomas's case, filled with doubt. They hardly appear to be the beginning of a movement that will transform human history. But there they were. And here we are. We too know what the disciples were feeling, don't we? We know about living behind locked doors in a culture of fear. We too are frightened disciples. 
And we know what fear leads to. Insecurity, anger, anxiety, physical illness, escapism, emotional paralysis, uncertainty, and doubt. And all too often, out of a sense of perceived threat and self-protection, fear leads to overreactive behavior. Well, we're not alone. This is a human situation. This is what it's like to be a person living behind those locked doors. And sometimes we stop there. Sometimes we decide that this is what matters most our safety, and living behind those doors is, if not inevitable, at least the best we have. And so we stay there, and there we are. But the story of Easter doesn't stop there. It goes on. It has more to say. The central thing the Easter story has to say is that God has gone through our locked doors just as Jesus did in the gospel. And God has come to us, just like that. God this, did this before we were fixed, before we were better, before we were well. Jesus didn't wait for the disciples to figure out that they didn't need to be afraid anymore and unlock the door themselves. He didn't wait for them to unlock the door. Jesus didn't wait for Thomas to stop doubting. He didn't wait for any of them to do anything different or to be anyone different. He showed up and loved them. That's all. That's what he did, and that's what he does. He comes through the doors that are there, and right in the middle of whatever our fears are, he loves us. That's what the resurrected Lord does. And we know that. We know it probably not exactly the same way the disciples did, but still we know that somehow or other, in some way or other, God has come through our locked doors into the very middle of whatever our fears are and loved us. We might or might not know with any clarity exactly what happened, or precisely when it happened, we might or might not know what it means. We might not even like it. But that doesn't matter very much. Because this is not magic. When God comes to us and loves us, everything doesn't suddenly become perfect. I mean, all the disciples lived and died in ways we would probably consider tragic. Legend has it that all the apostles died young, except John, who spent his last years in exile. So the reasons to stay behind locked doors are still there. But things are different at the same time. Even if we don't realize it or totally believe it, things are different on this side of Easter. If we stop at whatever keeps us locked up then the easter story goes on but we don't but even if we go further even if we admit that yes we have been met wherever we are hiding and yes maybe god is up to something with us even then if we stop there the story will go on without us because when god loves us god doesn't stop there when God loves us, God does something to us. Well, in our Bible story this morning, God does at least two somethings to us. The first thing God does is the first thing we heard Jesus do for the disciples on Easter day. God gives the gift of the Holy Spirit. God gives them God's power, God's grace, and God's guidance. This is what Jesus gave to the disciples when he breathed on them. This is the spirit we were given at our baptism. 
And this is the gift we have been given over and over as God reaches out to us and makes of us a new creation. <clears throat> Whether we are aware of it or not. Hang on a sec. Everybody just hang. When Jesus first breathed on those disciples, nothing much happened to them right away. And a week later, they're still hiding behind locked doors. The gift just sat there. It sat there because it took them a while to understand. And because for whatever reason, it took them a while to begin. That happens to us too. You see, when Jesus came to them behind their closed doors, and when Jesus loved them and gave them the gift of the Spirit, he did one more thing to them and to us. He said, as the Father sent me, even so I send you. And what the disciples discovered, that it was only as they tried to live out that mission and ministry, only as they tried to follow the Lord's command to be servants, it was only then they discovered within themselves the ability and strength Jesus had given them. It's only then they discovered that the spirit Jesus had breathed on them was a Holy Spirit of power. They didn't discover that until they stepped out from behind their locked doors. Because it wasn't there until they needed it. And then things changed. Still not magic. Things aren't all better, but things are different. Most of their issues were still there, but there was also something else. They discovered it was possible to be more than they had imagined and to do more than they had imagined. And in this way, the story that had started with Jesus continues as their story, and now as ours. As he helped the disciples, God helps us discover what we can be and what we can do if, if, if even when we are not completely free from doubt and uncertainty, we dare to step behind the locked doors of fear. If, if we can find the faith to move ahead beyond fear and doubt, our Lord assures us that in his name, we can do and become more than we ever imagined. Because whenever we cower behind the locked doors of our lives, Jesus is still present, even as he was for Thomas, gently and patiently breaking through our insecurities and doubts and calling us into a life of faith. Embracing Jesus as Thomas did, embracing Easter, leads us to see what is on the other side of our locked doors. Embracing Jesus as Thomas did offers us a different view, a different way from that of fear and doubt. It is a way of love and forgiveness and peace and tolerance and respect for others. Now, this is very difficult. I know that. It's always been difficult. In our humanness, we're bound to resist God's way of love because it seems so impossible. We're bound to feel like Thomas in his initial reaction. It's hard to believe something we cannot see. It's hard to believe the power of love and forgiveness and the power of God to overcome fear and bring good out of evil. It's hard to believe. And yet, Easter is what Jesus came to show Thomas and to teach him that God will not let the bad win out in the end. Easter is what Jesus comes to show us that by faith, we too will not let the bad win out at the last. Easter 
is that we can see the possibilities that come from joining Thomas in affirming Jesus as he did, saying, my Lord and my God. So that we might come to understand the power of what Jesus said to all the disciples when he appeared to them. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. He gave them, as he gives us, godly peace so we can move beyond the locked doors of our lives. Beyond what shuts us off from community with our brothers and sisters. The risen Christ makes himself known to us and gives us God's peace, setting us free from our fears. He gives us the keys to unlock the closed up doors of our lives. And when we unlock them with God's peace and love, we are free to begin living with the power of Easter in our heart. You are a people loved and given power and sent into the world. Always remember that. Thank God there is a way to be in the world that we didn't have just a generation ago. We need not be cut off. We need not stop extending the love of God. The Easter story continues, and we continue with it. Amen. So, continuing with our microphones muted, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 Now, I want to say that later in the prayers of the people, where we are invited to add our own petitions, I certainly do want you to unmute your mics and offer your petitions as a prayer is placed on your heart. So there will be the special needs and concerns of this congregation. There will be all the blessings of this life and for those who have died. In those three places, we certainly do want to hear from you as you are led by the Spirit. And now let us mute our mics um, and be led in the prayers of the people, form six. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone, for this community, the nation, and the world, for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace, for the just and proper use of your creation, 
for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and Sam and Anne, our bishops, and for all bishops and other ministers, for all who serve God in his church, for the special needs and concerns of this congregation. For Alan. For continued health for my family. Richard. So I feel like I'm brand new. Hear us, Lord. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. For this congregation. family and friends. For this beautiful day. For technology. We will exalt you, O God, our King and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them who put their trust in you. Hasten, O Father, the coming of thy kingdom, and grant that we, thy servants, who now live by faith, may with joy behold thy Son in his coming in glorious majesty, even Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. O God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this day such blessing through our worship of you that the week to come may be spent in your favor. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, we bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you for the honor of your name. Amen. <clears throat> and now please pray with me together with your mics muted. The prayer of St. Chrysostom. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. 
And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions that may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Amen. I'm sorry, I thought I'd muted my mic when I coughed. Uh, but now let's all unmute our mics. I want to see green across the board, as they say. Are you ready? <laughs> Let us trust the Lord. All right. Now muting our mic. The muting our We'll mute our mics so that Colin and Grace can lead us in our final hymn, and then we will visit afterwards. So I'm muting my microphone now. you very much. Um, now, folks, do remember there's a chat um, uh, feature, and you can always use that to uh, chat with each other but, uh, by, by, by type. Um, but also, we can speak now to each other, if you like. That was